everyone. I'm Danny Roddy of DannyRoddy.com, and today I'm talking with painter, philosopher, biologist Raymond Peet. In this hour-long episode, we'll talk about the creation of the CIA and its primary role in shaping the U.S. culture through painting, music, language, literature, economics, philosophy, religion, social activism, and politics. In addition to thanking Ray for talking with me today, I'd like to thank my patrons for making this show and all of the content I produce possible. If you would like to become a patron, please go to patreon.com slash Danny Rowdy. As always, please do your own research and come to your own conclusions. And in the spirit of William Blake, the true method of knowledge is experiment. Without further ado, here's the show. I feel like I just like crammed for a test, <laughs> but, I, but I've been, I read your newsletter I read the article, um, I forget his name, Paul Grain. I read a, like a few people distilling down that book because I couldn't get a hold of it. I read mm-hmm. the David Talbot book and I kind of reviewed through that. And then um, I found like a list of CIA atrocities, which was mind blowing. And then mm-hmm. you talking about the Indonesian genocide, I, I had no idea that's what the act of killing and the, and the sound of silence were about. And I, I mean... I knew it was the general idea, but I, I didn't put it together. And those movies made like a huge impact on me a few years ago. And so I, I was pretty shocked. And so I guess my, I like starting things off, I guess it might be interesting to get, to get your current uh, read on the political situation. Because for me, that was the thing that got me interested in exploring the past. Like, how did we end up here? And your newsletter, specifically when you said that the CIA was... Uh, I have like a glare on my screen here. Uh, they were treating the world like an orchard, fertilizing some trees, pruning others, and removing unwanted trees and weeds. That was just uh, really interesting to me. And so I was like, okay, well, if you go back in the past, maybe you can figure out how we got here. And so I guess your general thoughts on like free speech, this left-right thing, uh, the media, and like race tensions, and it being more interesting coming from you because you've lived through Vietnam, civil rights, et cetera. I think that the place you decide to start it is sort of arbitrary. Like uh, <laughs> <laughs> my consciousness uh, started early uh, during the Roosevelt time, and uh, are well, you well, aware? Well, I was going to ask you. I was going to uh, get your general thoughts on the current situation, and then jump right back into like uh, Pearl Harbor. But we can start. Do you want to go with Pearl Harbor first, or or go from oh. the place that you wanted to go? Uh, well, one perspective I have that uh, sort of bring th- brings things up to the, the present, if you look at the coup against FDR in 1933 and 34, as described to Congress by Smedley Butler, they went basically quiet for several years. Uh, the, the coolest, uh, the, the great corporations of, of the country that wanted to get rid of Roosevelt because he was uh, committing treason to their class, they thought. And they went quiet and focused on Harry Truman in the late 1930s as uh, their guy who they put in place uh, finally in 1944. And then, uh, as I see it, uh, they opportunately uh, killed Roosevelt just before he found out what uh, Alan Dulles was doing with the Nazis. And so they had Truman in place when they shifted over to the Nazi Dulles side. And during that time, Fletcher Prouty, during during the Second World War, was involved in a lot of the secret plans going on in Asia. And uh, he tells a little about that in his book, The Secret Team, which refers to the the sort of privately operated uh, CIA as related to Nixon and the Kennedy assassination. And uh, along uh, this stretch of time, you have people like Ted Shackley and uh, Ronald Reagan getting put in place with the assistance of George G.H.W. Bush and the um, October Surprise, uh, you know, where uh, he went to Paris I think was to um, make uh, deals with the Iranians for them not to release the hostages until they got Jimmy Carter out of office. Uh, On the airplane to uh, Paris with Bush uh, as uh, high officials that everyone knew who was there, 
John Senator John Hines and John Tower, conservative right wing Republicans, uh, were on that same flight. And uh, several years later, on successive days, April 4 and April 5 of 91, they both died in airplane crashes. Uh, and the people who uh, were in a position to to know what George Sr. and his associates were doing all came to bad ends. Nixon and Schlesinger got put out through Watergate, and uh, Carter got put out by, by various manipulations, such as the October surprise. And all of these things interact, and periodically someone starts to string the pieces together, and they very thoroughly get wiped out as far as anything taken seriously goes. Like, do you know about Daniel Sheehan and the Christic Institute? No. Um, He did a lot of putting together and uh, sued the government for murder and assassination and such. And uh, even though he had the evidence together, he was his organization was destroyed because the, the judge said it was frivolous. <laughs> and he had to pay all of the legal expenses, and, and that bankrupted his organization. Is this along the same line, uh, lines? So I was looking at the JFK stuff, they, and I, I'm skipping super far ahead here. But they said like Edward J. Epps, Epstein was like one of the biggest critics, and the idea was that the the CIA had enough fortitude, or I don't know the right word, but they were saying they set up their critics, set up opposition to the ideas, so that it would be controlled basically afterwards. Um, I, yeah, I, I quoted the um, I think it was Braden was it who who said he called it his mighty Wurlitzer that could play any tune he wanted, and uh, their their best loudspeakers were at Washington Post and New York Times, and uh, the Washington Post was one of the most effective in in wiping out people like Christic Institute. And that's Operation Mockingbird, they call it? Oh, oh, uh, yeah, uh, that was one of its time names. But um, basically, it's just what they do. Uh, when I was reading David Talbot's book, he said, like, Henry Luce, the time life guy, was so <laughs> interconnected to everybody and these these major news outlets just had hardcore agendas, and we're all being manipulated by Dulles, basically. Oh, oh yeah, they're they're all the same people. The, the CIA guys were recruited from among those. It's like the scum of the ruling class. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, stepping back a little bit, you had mentioned a few times that you thought like the culture had changed in 1947. And so I thought it was interesting that that coincided with the creation of the CIA. And I guess if, if you wanted to un- unpack that and talk about that l- a little bit, that would be awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, the um, 1944 Democrat convention, uh, I knew several of the people who were there, and they stayed just furiously bitter for 50 years afterwards about what happened. Uh, Fake tickets were printed up for people who had never been in the election, and the the real delegates were uh, shut out. Uh, So it was a completely phony convention that chose uh, Truman to be the next president. Who do you think was Uh, behind that? That same group that started the coup in 33 and 34, uh, just the top Morgan and DuPont were the only names that I recall, but it was uh, the the top powers in the corporations. They got Truman in position, and then Dulles had been a a Nazi finance agent, but between the banks and the corporations of Germany, uh, Rockefeller and um, Farben, uh, so he was a buddy with all of the top Nazis, and he was in uh, Switzerland dealing with the Nazis, arranging for them not to fight the Americans coming up the Italian peninsula so that they could go hold off the Russians to keep the Russians from getting all the way through Germany. And uh, Stalin, through his spies, found out what was going on in the first week or two of April of 1945. And uh, Roosevelt said, maybe Stalin uh, is losing it because uh, this couldn't be happening, that Stalin must be making it up that Dulles is, is letting the, the German 
Italian branch of the army head to the Eastern Front. And before FDR found out that, in fact, Stalin was right, he was dead. And if he had found out, that would have revealed that Dulles was leading a pro-Nazi army, basically, dealing with the Galen intelligence organization and the top army people to um, unite the Americans with the Nazis against Russia to hold them off so that they could keep control of Western Europe. And and so the the whole denazification thing in Germany was fraudulent. They just changed their party labels. And as many of them, uh, of the technical people as possible, uh, were brought into the U.S., uh, Werner von Braun for the rockets and such. And uh, instead of denazifying Germany, the U.S. was nazified. You were actually there. Were, were there any people saying, like, what what is going on? Like, how are these Nazis being brought over here? And just was anybody asking those questions or was the press just not doing its job? Almost no one was was concerned that they said they were denazified, so they're okay. They were really the, the good underground Nazis. Uh, and uh, the Nazi reality never sank in. The thing of Conrad Lorenz getting the Nobel Prize, <laughs> he was the, the architect of genocide. Uh, and even in his uh, post-Nobel book, he kept using all of the ideas that he had presented to Hitler as as the reason for exterminating uh, black people, gypsies, Jews, uh, Slavs, uh, all of the people that, that got killed wholesale were um, justified by the specific things that Conrad Lorenz wrote. And he kept writing them, but instead of saying, I forget what the German word was, but um, in, in his newer book, he said something less intense than extirpated, something like uh, milder, like weeded out. I don't remember the exact language, but it was just slightly milder than than uh, genocide. It reminds me of Obama getting the Nobel Peace Prize for dropping bombs for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so 1947 the creation of the CIA under Truman. President Truman signs the National Security Act of 1947, and that uh, gives like un, like no rules to the CIA. By that time, he knew who Alan Dulles was, if he had any brain at all. <laughs> <laughs> that, that whole thing became fairly public, except it didn't get to Roosevelt in time to save his life. I might have missed it, but why, why was it necessary to kill Roosevelt? Well, because um, Dulles and his people were all committing horrible treason and uh, setting up the Cold War, setting up Europe to make war against Russia. And if if Stalin was aware of of everything that was going on, was there there no way for him to penetrate the propaganda that would be coming or was happening? Okay, no, because the 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 jukebox was. Being operated by Dulles and, and his people, and that's uh, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, or that that's just one aspect of it. Well, yeah, and radio stations and the great newspapers, and ninety-five percent of the newspapers followed Washington Post and New York Times. There were only three newspapers that were known for being independent, and they weren't very independent. It was the uh, what were they, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Medford Mail Tribune, and the El Cajon, California Valley News. <laughs> Three little newspapers that had a, a worldwide reputation for being independent out of thousands of papers in the U.S. Francis says, whether they liked it or not, whether they knew it or not, there were few writers, poets, artists, historians, scientists, or critics in post-war Europe, whose names were not in some way linked to this covert enterprise, and she was referring to uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom. Um, yeah. So, like, even if you didn't know you were part of this cabal, you were actually part of it, basically. Uh, yeah, the, the pressures, like if all of the newspapers and radio stations and foundations in the U.S. said it was criminal to uh, think otherwise, 
if you had other opinions, you were just quiet because everyone around you seemed crazy. Did you just keep your thoughts to yourself at that time? <laughs> I, no, no. I was in the seventh grade in a social studies class. I, I had done things like. Uh, uh, the the uh, seventh grade boys were supposed to spend their recess time cleaning the grounds, picking up papers and such. And I put up posters showing a, a reclining gopher and uh, <laughs> organized the the loafer gophers instead of the eager beavers, which they called us, and got scolded for that. And then in the social studies class, a kid who uh, he was. Uh, just kind of a goofy, nice kid, uh, asked Mrs. White, the teacher, uh, uh, are they going to kill Raymond Pete uh, <laughs> because, for being a communist, if that's uh, uh, the, the policy? And she said, I don't think so. He's a nice little boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, okay, so... Uh, Eisenhower is 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 he following the same line of being put in the presidency like Truman, or is he like the real deal? Basically, he was very stupid, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, he was he was just uh, uh, following the ruling class, whatever they said. And, and Alan Dulles was CIA director in 1953 under Eisenhower. Yeah, and Eisenhower it came out by witness many years later that he had specifically given orders to kill Patrice Lumumba. I was going to ask you and, about that. Go, sorry, go ahead. And, and at the time, uh, I was um, considering both Eisenhower and Kennedy, who had been elected by that time, as having been involved. Kennedy should have been, as president-elect, he should have been aware of what was happening because I was just reading the newspapers, following everything day by day, and uh, I started right out being very negative towards Kennedy, and and so uh, just a, f a few months, I think uh, two or three months later, was when Doug Hammarskjöld was killed in a plane crash. I figured that uh, Kennedy must have been responsible because it was <laughs> right in his administration under his direct authority, that the CIA was there in charge of things. And Doug Hammarskjöld had been facilitating the imperialists in the Congo. The Belgian, British, and American agents were there, and pretty much Hammarskjöld was just doing what they wanted. But after Patrice Lumumba was killed, Hammarskjöld suddenly started being even-handed, and he was going to arrange peace discussions between the two sides, and that was when he got killed, and so it was obviously an assassination. I want to get to Doug Hammarskjöld and also uh, George de Mornschild. Do you want to set up just your thoughts on the antagonism between JFK and Dulles? Like, I, I'm confused how somebody like that even got into office if I guess they hated him so much. So, like, the idea that everything is totally pre-selected is, is false. There's some... Well, well uh, his, his, uh, Kennedy's ploy was to uh, go after Eisenhower and Nixon for being weak on communism. And he said we, he would lead a great military buildup, which he did. And so he was the, the militarist's candidate. He said that the um, Eisenhower had let him in on the fact that they were going to invade Cuba. And he, part of his militarism was saying, Eisenhower has let Castro get away with everything. We'll, we'll go after Castro. And so he was the, the right-wing extremist in that election. And that really annoyed Nixon because Nixon had told him what they were going to do. And, and Nixon couldn't say, wait, we're already planning that. Uh, so Kennedy was was basically a, a rat for bad reasons. Okay, so that conflicts with, I guess, just my... Uh it, it it always sounds like, uh, at least from David Talbot and some of the other things, like that JFK was like anti-war or that he was like a reasonable kind of person. But I really have no idea. Another thing that annoyed me, he might really have been upset over the Hammarskjöld killing because of what Hammarskjöld had in mind for Indonesia, which was to um, make 
Sukarno a puppet of the U.S. rather than leaving it with Netherlands. Uh, or uh, he, Kennedy had his uh, way of, of uh, controlling uh, Indonesia without the uh, formality of colonialism. But despite whatever uh, relative good he saw for Indonesia, he was still thinking imperialism. And twice he talked to his ambassador to Brazil, asking if it was basically uh, time to do a coup yet against Joao Goulart. Uh, and the ambassador said, when the time is opportune. But there was nothing urgent right then. Paul Grain describes like a, some plot where they def- uh, discovered some mineral that they wanted, and then Dulles was friends with George Morinschild. And um, do you want to help me out here? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, n- uh, neither Kennedy nor Hammerschild nor just about anyone in the world knew about neither the, the high quality oil or the uh, the gold and uh, what was the other gold and copper. I guess were the two huge deposits in Indonesia. The Dulles, uh, Morinschild people had been secretive about that, so none of the authorities knew about it because they wanted to get the Dutch out before they let it become public. The, the Dutch companies would have taken over, but the, the Rockefeller people bought up the properties, uh, and uh, I think they still own it through a Phoenix-based company. Okay, so under the guise of anti-communism, the CIA overthrows the democratically elected Sukarno with a military coup. The CIA has been trying to eliminate Sukarno since 1957, using everything from attempted assassination to sexual intrigue for nothing more than declaring his uh, neutrality uh, in the Cold War. And according to Paul Grain or an article that was about his book, he said that Sukarno not siding with Dulles like enraged him. And if if you weren't against, like a, the Bush thing, like if you're not with us, you're against us kind of deal. Yeah, that, that was all it was with Joao Goulart in Brazil. Uh, Kennedy said that he used looking slightly neutral <laughs> will we have to <laughs> get rid of him right away or later <laughs> when i read the list of atrocities through this the cia it seemed just like bonkers like that somebody is going to all these different areas putting in their person and it seemed uh, good uh, they had the morality of adolf hitler with more brains <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I I guess, do you see Dulles as the person driving all of these different things? Because it it seems like it would take somebody like pretty, I don't know, it it just seems so, I mean, from an outsider looking in, it seems so complex how to manage all of these different like regime changes, basically. I I think you have to visualize the, the ruling class and how it works. It has these um, upper levels of academics and um, political lawyers uh, for the big corporations are basically working like secretaries of state and intelligence agency heads and such. Uh, so there's a whole crop of these very well-informed people at the at the heart of, of both economic and political affairs. And so... Uh, they're they're like a, a worldwide sort of a, a course mesh, only a, a few hundred people on that level uh, sitting on top of thousands of corporations, maybe um, three million or so ruling class people in America and, and Europe. They, they already have the power, and so the state power is fairly trivial compared to how we think of it. They see the the state officials as uh, inconveniences, but not too hard to get rid of. Uh, two things. So one, they, uh, the creation of the CIA gave this, uh, would you use the word oligarchy, Ray? Mm-hmm. So oligarchy gave like a, a tool basically to, uh, through the CIA to do whatever they wanted to do? Yeah, yeah. And then to put yourself in this uh, type of uh, behavioral pattern, do you see it, and you mentioned this in your newsletter, like the neo-Darwinian marriage with Malthusianism, do you see that as like a type of elite or like power elite religion for them kind of to justify a lot of their crazy actions? Um, it, yeah, it, it, the science world is very similar to the, the finance politics world and has its intersections not not very many, but uh, a few of the 
type of science people are are closely connected to, to the political power, uh, but it's all the same recognition of power and where they're going and who they want to control for what purposes. And then, okay, so we're talking about the Indonesian mass genocide, which happened in 1965 and 1966. Do you want to talk about the interesting connection between Obama and his mom, and Dunham, and Lolo, and his stepdad, Lolo Sotoro? Am I saying that right? Um, uh, well, uh, what's his name? This, this um, reporter who did the... Oh, uh, uh, um, uh, May... Let me get his name. Uh, Madsen. Madsen. Wayne yeah. Madsen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think his his picture is, is basically right, that his grandmother was probably connected with the CIA as sort of a paymaster for people in, in the Pacific. And I don't know exactly, but a, a friend of mine was a, sort of a tool of the Nugan Hand Bank, which was the, uh, the CIA funnel from drug weapons money in Vietnam and Iran-Contra uh, through the, the 60s and 70s. That opium and weapons money uh, was handled through the Australia and, and Hawaii. So I, I assume there's been some interaction between uh, the, the bank that Grandma Obama, what was her name, uh, uh, the, the, his maternal grandmother's I have it here bank. somewhere. Anyway, the the, um, the 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 fact is that his mother was uh, doing uh, uh, Madeline anthrop- and, and Stanley Dunham. Sorry, Dunham. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she was, uh, I think, a vice president of, of the bank that was handling CIA money. But, but his mother was in that anthropology study, uh, pretty much the anthropology professor pr- profession was uh, serving the CIA, mapping out people to either exterminate or, or control, basically finding out how they talk. Uh, like the um, in Mexico and Latin America, it was the Summer Linguistics Institute, which codified the, the native languages and uh, gave them written materials so they could be controlled better, learning uh, how to give them instructions, essentially and anthropology and uh, religious missionaries uh, were tied into the, the CIA to gather information on on the populations. And in Indonesia, it happened that the anthropology people were helping make surveys of basically who was to be exterminated by the new government to uh, make sure that they didn't go neutral or favor China. Backing up a little bit, you mentioned opium. And and how much of that is involved in the power elite, just like, I guess, uh, funding things? I read a book on, or not, I didn't read, I perused a book on Skull and Bones, and they were saying that that whole thing is is very tied to the sale of opium. And then I didn't read enough before talking to you, but I had read similar things about the CIA, just drugs being very intertwined with everything, basically. Um, Yeah, I I think they use whatever has forced the religious missionaries are one way of doing it. Drugs are another, and uh, just force is another. Okay, so we talked about the Indonesian mass genocide, which uh, anybody listening, The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence by Joshua Oppenheimer. Ray, have you seen those films? No, no. They're really good. And then in in 1966, something that might be interesting, the Ramparts Affair, like the medical, a magazine uh, began uh, untangling the nefarious acts of the CIA? Um, uh, some people are saying that that the CIA was subsidizing them and promoting them to do uh, a partial limited <laughs> hangout. <laughs> that the, the facts are so much worse that they want to make it seem that everything has come out and make people stop looking at the connections. When you start putting things together, like even the the conservative senators, uh, Hines and and Tower, having that connection to to George Bush and information uh, that was inconvenient. Uh, And then that ties into uh, John Kerry and his investigation of that bunch of episodes and, and why he didn't pursue it. 
and it shows uh, interconnectedness in government that on the surface it would seem really crazy to to connect extreme right-wing senators to extreme left-wing organizations like the Christic Institute. But when you start weaving the strings together, you get a thousand parts that fit snugly together and it starts looking somewhat crazy to to say, no, they can't fit together. That's only a coincidence. You get thousands of coincidences snugly organized, then you have to look for a more reasonable explanation. And uh, uh, the um, official explanation starts sounding crazy. What year was it when Bush and Kerry ran against each other and they're both Skull and Bones members? Like, what a coincidence. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay. I I was interested in uh, big new Brzezinski, David Rockefeller, and the Trilateral Commission. Brzezinski was controlling Carter, basically. Rockefeller was controlling Brzezinski and Brzezinski Carter. And Brzezinski cooked up the thing of getting Saudi Arabia to um, start sending people into Afghanistan with U.S. weapons to, uh, you know, the Soviets had set up a a secular government in Afghanistan with education for women uh, and um, an actual secular government. Like every time a a secular government is created in the Muslim world, it's as bad as as being neutral. Uh, (laughs) And uh, uh, Brzezinski was... uh, one example of that, the, the overthrow of Mossadegh in, in Turkey, that was uh, their first big anti-secular case. Uh, but then the, the, the most fanatic anti-secularism came when the Soviets had set up a non-religious government with basically de- democratic practices as a, a way of keeping the U.S. from expanding, hopefully, uh, you know, the... the um, the Cuban Missile Crisis had the outcome of the U.S. agreeing to take their rockets out of Turkey, and the Soviets hoped to uh, get another uh, buffer state without rockets in it in Afghanistan. And to, to prevent that, Brzezinski got the fanatics armed with um, the best weapons to uh, fight the Afghan democracy and then the Soviets who supported it. And uh, that went on until uh, Carter was out of office. And eventually the fanatics won under extreme support from the U.S. I I think it's floating around the Internet, but there are articles showing what Afghanistan looked like in the 1970s. And to me, I have a poor history background, but it's like unbelievable. And it just looks like a 1970s modern people walking around. And then they do like comparative shots to today. And it's just like rubble. Um, and, and also, well, well, and, and the religious extremism was mm-hmm. all created by Brzezinski. Yeah, and there's like a video of Brzezinski uh, like arming the mu- uh, Mujahideen and just saying some of the craziest stuff. Like, uh, your, it's your land over there. Like, go fight. And it's just very manipulative and weird. And yeah. uh, it's bizarre. And they brought, they brought the same sort of people into Serbia. And took over Kosovo. Unbelievable. Okay, so um, it's interesting to me that Brzezinski is, was so tied to Obama. He was in Obama's inner circle. Obama talked very highly of him. People that I follow were, were saying like the hope and change candidate was preposterous given who was in Obama's inner circle. But I guess that message didn't really get out to that many people. Uh, yeah, it's the same sort of thing as uh, Hillary Clinton praising Henry Kissinger, it really uh, revealed who she really is. Uh, And uh, you've heard about her newest book in which she explains George Orwell's uh, The Real Meaning of of 1984. I didn't catch that part, no. (laughs) Uh, She says it it means we should trust our leaders, (laughs) experts, and the press more. That reminds me of um, uh, Mayor Giuliani when he says um, uh, real freedom is about obeying authority or something similar to that. Uh, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) The the meaning of 1984. (laughs) Unbelievable. So maybe this is a good time to start with the beginning question. What's your, like having been through so much, do you see 
your sense of how things are? Is this like incomprehensible or, or like what's happening right now? Or is it a logical continuation of things you've been seeing in the works for many years now is, I guess, my question. The only pleasant thing about it is that so many other people are starting to see the loose ends where before, if you had, for example, an economic theory of why wars were fought, you were either ignorant or crazy <laughs> or criminal or a subversive. But uh, the, the atmosphere has really changed so that there are lots of people questioning things now that unlike 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, one thing I did think was interesting to your point was I feel like if you talked about the deep state, you would be labeled as a crazy person. And the fact that it is being talked about openly on just n regular news is is pretty weird, no? Uh, yeah. People always prefer surfaces, but now the surface is, is being slightly redefined. But, you know, before you could see the surface that the state said it was, it wasn't true that the state was really rotten all the way down. And now they analyze it and say, here's the surface and there's the deep state. But it's always been just one rotten state. And uh, now people are, are starting to break it down into its parts and seeing what the illusion how, how it's maintained, how consent is manufactured. Like some of the things you, you said taken maybe out of context could be probably fuel for a libertarian anti-government view. But do you, do you see just the creation of the CIA as becoming a total nightmare as being just the real issue and not necessarily the government per se? Um, no. Uh, like when the, the um, people first started separating the CIA from the government was when uh, Eisenhower had scheduled peace talks with Khrushchev in Europe, and um, everyone was expecting big things of that. And then with Lee Harvey Oswald, a U-2 expert in place in Russia, Dulles sent a U-2 plane over Russia, and knowing that they had the expert who knew exactly the, the recipe for shooting it down, overcoming their radar defenses. And during the few days before the peace talk, to send this U-2 biplane over to be shot down, knew that it would sabotage the talks. Eisenhower knew who, who, who Dulles was and um, uh, still let it shoot down uh, the um, peace talks. Uh, and uh, Eisenhower was stupid, but he was also the one who kept Dulles in place and knew how things worked. Uh, so you, you could say that there was uh, there were different factions working, but they weren't really separate. Um, they were just slightly inconvenient to each other. We glossed over that a little bit, but um, I did watch a video by a woman named Lisa Peace, who seemed pretty intelligent. And she was uh, echoed what you just said, saying that uh, Oswald was incredibly um, good at radar and, and locating those U U2. Was, that was the, the plan? That, yeah, that, that was what he was trained for, mm -hmm. as well as speaking Russian but, in Japan. <laughs> but she was uh, spinning the narrative that it was like in the official story of the JFK ass assassination just is like completely illogical <laughs> and doesn't make any sense, and, and given all of Oswald's uh, alleged CIA ties. Oh, oh yeah. The, the um, information that has come out, it, it's a, a complete fine-grained picture of, of what was going on in the assassination. Uh, all of the context fits in who, who was murdered, what the, the, the official story, how it was composed, what the function of the Warren Commission was. There's not really any any mystery anymore. In David Talbot's book, The Devil's Chessboard, is is a pretty good summation of that. I haven't read that. Oh, my fault. I thought you had. What is your general thought on Trump? Do you see him as part of this uh, uh, oligarchical cabal, or do you see him as like a free agent, or what, what are your general thoughts on him? Yeah, I, I think he's a, a free agent with some good instincts, but also an instinct of preservation, self-interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, his, his thing about uh, not wanting nuclear war, I, I think is his basic good impulse, but what can you do just being president? 
Some people were like when the election was happening, they when he was meeting with Kissinger were just like, oh, no, this guy is no good, basically, because he was aligning himself with those people. Did you think of anything of that? Um, no, I think he's insincere uh, <laughs> about most of what he does. <laughs> but but his two or three decent policies, he seemed over the years to to come up with some insights like about 20 years ago when he suggested having a, a one-time wealth tax. He said it would cost him, I forget what, $200 million or something, but he said it would pay off the national debt and then we'd be a bit almost tax-free from then on. Interesting. Has he talked about that recently or that was just an older thing in one of his books? No, I haven't heard any recent discussion of that. Okay, Ray, I think I've exhausted my uh, notes. Oh, the one thing I did want to talk about was I, that I thought was really interesting was Truman saying that the, the whole creation of the CIA was a mistake um, to his uh, autobiographist, if that's uh, a word, uh, Mary Miller in 1973. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, recognizing any of its evil, how could he say otherwise? Yeah, really. Well, well he... He like went on and he was uh, said like uh, what I can tell. Um, I don't have the quote in front of me, but he's saying that the CIA makes their own wars, which we've been basically talking about for an hour. And also, I think he said has a quote saying that they killed Dag Hammarskjöld. He says, "Yeah, yep, yeah." Dag Hammarskjöld was the point of getting something done when they killed him. Notice that I said when they killed him. Truman said that, yeah. which is nuts. Yeah. Uh, the the testimony, uh, a witness to the cabinet meeting where uh, Eisenhower told them to do it. It didn't come out for 50 years after that, but everyone knew it at the time. I suppose Truman had much better information than the public. And um, just because I'm looking at it right now, do you have any thoughts on Lyman, the nutty actions of Lyman Lemitzer, who wrote Operation Northwoods? And I think he was the architect of Operation Gladio. What about him? I mean, reading through Operation Northwoods is is like sobering on how how crazy things can get. Um, yeah, but I think that's um, partly uh, the fault of people who keep records. Usually, the most disgusting things that they do in conversation and don't don't do stupid things like keeping records. <laughs> Do you think that was a mistake that they let out? I think that was like declassified under Clinton or somebody. Um, yeah, yeah. That was the, the, but even the, even the the act of keeping records, I'm sure they don't do it with the really vile stuff. I, when I was reading through all this stuff, I was like, this is like one percent of what's happening, and I couldn't fathom what else was going on. Basically, uh, yeah. And in that situation. Uh, people are are free to imagine, and their imagination can seldom, uh, you know, catch up uh, to to the, what's really happening right now. To end on a positive note, I mean, do you I, obviously you embody a type of resistance to what's happening by giving people good information and in, in trying to let people navigate their own lives. Do you do you see? Is this are things so bad that you don't see them getting better for a long time? Or do you see some hope? Or, I mean, you were mentioning that people were kind of waking up individually. Um, uh, yeah, and if you just uh, get a lot of people with some very simple insights, like abuse of power is going to be the rule, so there should never be uh, power exercised uh, in private or in secret, uh, just insist on complete openness and uh, people will uh, just sort of automatically start moving in the right direction, uh, which they won't necessarily know until they get uh, a lot of that openness into the culture uh, so that people can see where they are. Then they can start talking about where they want to go with the control systems through the media and the schools and the legal system, everything is going to have, have to happen outside of all of those channels. And it would have to consist just in some basic insights and suspicions of power. To your point, James Ingleton, CIA counterintelligence head, 
said in his testimony to the church committee, it is inconceivable that a secret intelligence arm of the government has to comply with all the overt orders of the government. <laughs> Uh, that's it for me, Ray. Did you have anything else we glossed over that, or you thought that was important? Oh, probably nothing occurs to me. <laughs> Ray, what are you working on right now? Oh, I'm, I'm an article on milk, putting milk in cultural context. Milk as as a, a sort of a focus of doing what we're doing here, looking at at the uh, the false assumptions and uh, thinking about how to start rethinking things from a new point. Awesome. I cannot wait to read it. Ray, you've been so generous with with your time. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. Fun to talk to you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Ray. Bye. That's going to conclude this week's episode. I'd like to thank Ray again for talking with me today, along with my patrons for their support of the show and all of the content I produce, none of which would be possible without my patrons. So from the bottom of my heart, I sincerely appreciate it. This episode was really fun for me. Uh, I Sometimes I say I know enough about nutrition to know that I don't know anything, and I can't even say that about politics. So it was uh, definitely a learning experience talking with Ray, who is obviously a wealth of information. Uh, again, I, it was awesome talking with him and I, would like to thank him again for just giving me an hour of his time and writing a great, uh, s- set of newsletters. And this episode, if you don't know, was based on his n- newsletter. And so you can get his, uh, newsletter now by, uh, sending, I think $28 to, uh, Ray Pete's newsletter at gmail.com. Uh, and I think it's $28 for, uh, six issues each year. So 12 total over two years. And so, yeah, it's the best deal on the internet and you should definitely do that. If you liked this uh, episode and you're listening on YouTube, definitely hit that like button or leave a comment and I'll try to reply to all of them. Thank you guys so much. It's been, uh, this was a real fun episode and I'm glad I got to do it. I know it's been a little, uh, the content hasn't been as uh, flowing as it usually is. A lot of people know I'm writing a book right now, but again, I sincerely appreciate you guys listening. It's always fun to do these things and I'll talk to you guys very soon. Take care.